people always ask me, say, what's your biggest mistake? I said, and I always say, I don't know. I haven't done it yet, which, which means I've, I've had some doozies. I mean, like the pheasant farm and others. I mean, I've had some real doozies that I've done. But what I mean is we're always going to make mistakes and they're always going to be big. You know, let's hope they're big because that means you're going to do something bigger that's more successful. And that's just the nature of, you know, the nature of learning. And yeah, every day you you typically well, you learn how people do it, the way they do it. And sometimes the learning is, nah, I don't want to do it that way. You know, uh, that's OK, too. And and I think that's that's what you also get from, you know, like a mentor from other people like you, you find your you find where you're solid at, you know, in terms of like, this is how I do it. And and I'm I'm that way. I You know, I try to be as uh, centered and you, know, you speak in a Japanese like like a keto. It's a great example. And have, having practiced that for a number of years, you, you learn to be centered. And I think that's important in, in who you are and what you are. Jeffrey Hazlett is the chairman and CEO of C-Suite Network, home of the world's most trusted network of C-Suite leaders. He sits on the board of over 14 companies, several of which are publicly listed companies. He is the former Fortune 100 CMO, the author of four best-selling business books, and a globally sought-after speaker. He has also been a primetime television host and... He is also the host of a business podcast. Jeffrey is frequently cited in Forbes, Success, Mashable, Marketing Week, Chief Executive, among many others. He is often on Bloomberg, MSNBC, Fox Business, and C-Suite TV. He is a former Bloomberg contributing editor and primetime host, and has appeared as a guest celebrity judge on NBC's Celebrity Apprentice with Donald Trump for three seasons. In this episode, we talked about his journey, his mentors, the hardest thing about being a publicly listed company board member, the best thing about running with companies that are publicly listed, and many more. So I hope you enjoy this episode with Jeffrey because I know I did. Thank you very much. Let's go to the show. So Jeffrey, you have tremendous amount of experience in your life. What got you interested in entrepreneurship to begin with? Oh, I like making money, but I like solving people's problems. And I think that's really what you're about. You know, I think the key thing is when you sit down and you're an entrepreneur or running any business, the first question you probably should ask yourself is what problem are we solving? And that's the way I look at things. So when I, you know, get started, but I, I love, I love doing things. I just love starting new things. And in fact, Quite frankly, I, I lose attention span after a couple of years. You know, it, it, it's hard for me to stick with something. Right now, the longest thing I've ever stayed with is the C-suite network. But that's because we're building other businesses all the time. We're using our platform to be able to help people to scale their businesses and make money while they're sleeping. So we're pretty excited. And that may, that's that been a lot of fun for me. But what actually got you started on this journey? Was there someone in your, like your father or mother or grandparents who were entrepreneurial? Was there someone that gave you that kind of like jolt? No, nope. <laughs> My dad was in the United States Air Force. He was a sergeant all of his career, served a couple of tours in Nam and uh, spent time. My mother was a bookkeeper, later became in later life after I was an adult, she became a real estate agent, but that's what she did. Um, you know, I just, I just found early on, uh, you know, I moved out of the house when I was 16. So I was on my own, you know, and I was selling everything from Amway door to door to working at McDonald's, whatever I could do to, you know, survive or eat. So maybe that was part of it, but I just always knew that I was going to do business. I was always going to do something big or felt I was always going to do something big. And I just kept doing it. So I kept swinging away. And then, you know, in my 20s, I, I said, no, I'm going to I started a business. You know, I was working for a, as a lobbyist and, you know, doing political campaigns. And then I w went to work for the American Diabetes Association. And then I basically I was getting fired. So I started up a PR firm and um, and then the rest was history. You know, I started I remember one time somebody called me. This is fun, Sean. They, they, somebody called me and I was the music was really loud. And my business name was Hazlett and Associates. That was my first week. And, and my first client called me right when the music was playing in the background. It was really loud. And I, I said, hey, hang on just a second. I went and ran, turned down the stereo. And he came back. He goes, was that your associates? You know, so, you know, that was his way of saying, Hazlett, I know you got nobody working for you. It's just you. But that was funny. So how did that person find you and how did you close them? 
That was a it was a medical school. So I was doing some work on the side, you know, as when I was a lobbyist and doing stuff for American Diabetes Association nationwide. And I was back in South Dakota and I had some good friends and they, they were working on the medical school in South Dakota and thinking about closing it down. And if you know anything about, you know, like in a rural area, if they don't have doctors, they don't have, you know, medical facilities, you know, or people to be able to serve them, then it's not very good for the community. So South Dakota invested early on to start its own medical school, and it was a struggling thing. And and here I was, you know, um, I was I was well known for running political campaigns, well known for running a lot of, you know, marketing kinds of things, even at a young age. And so I was a hustler. And so a friend of mine introduced me to him and that, they became my very first customer was the, you know, you know, University of South Dakota Medical School. And my job was to keep them from closing, which we did. And that school of medicine is going well now. But in the early years, you know, um, you see a lot of competition. You know, when when you have new doctors coming into an area, some of the old doctors don't didn't want that. Uh, just a few of those. But they and they use political power to try to shut it down at one point. And my job was to make sure that didn't occur. And so we raised the raised the value of of the perception of the value of the medical school. We raised its uh, its you know how it was satisfying a real need, especially in rural rural areas of the state, even though the whole state was fairly rural. And um, we were bringing specialties to the state that were madly needed for by the number of people, whether it's you know uh, you know all the different specialties you could possibly internal medicine and. Uh, various various others that you could think of. And that's what my job was, you know, was to do that. And, you know, and, and basically all my life, whether it's a box of, see, a box of soap, a, a political candidate, a medical school or, you know, a, a widget or a service, I've been selling stuff ever since. I think a lot of people listening might still be on that first PR agency, marketing agency, software company. Yeah. How long did you run that company for did you shut it down? Did you sell it? What, what was the the end result with that company? I bought. So I, I every time I every time I've gone in between companies, I always go back to starting that kind of consulting company. So the Hazlett Group, the Hazlett Associates, the Hazlett Company has always been in and out. You know, I bought and sold over two hundred fifty businesses in my career, about twenty five billion in transactions. You know, leading up to where I'm at today, and um, I ran that PR firm for about. I'm going to say six or eight years. And then I started another, you know, during that time, I started a cellular phone company when it was first getting started. I started a television station, got a license for a television station, which eventually became the Fox network here in uh, this area. And then I decided, you know, what I was doing in South Dakota, geez, I could do that in Iowa. And then I could do that across the country. And oh my gosh, I could do that in Japan. I could do that in China. I could do that in London. I could do that everywhere. And so I just learned that, you know, what I was doing, you know, I bought a printing company, turned that printing company into a multi-million dollar business. And, and then I went out and started representing printers, you know, and, and, you know, doing a lot of different work. So I always had the, the PR company on one side and then my other businesses on the other. And many of them complemented each other because imagine the printing business. I started an association management company where we managed associations like 100 different associations. Well, they need printing. Uh, they need they need events. So I started an event company. And so that was part of the services that we did. I bought the equipment from the Who, the band The Who. And uh, if you needed staging and lighting, boom, you could call me. And 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 I and I rented the those semi trucks out for, you know, for concerts for different groups and stuff. So all, you know, somewhat related and and, you know, I even started a pheasant farm one time and I tried to corner the market on pheasants till I realized there wasn't one. Right. So, you know, I, I got some successes and I got some some failures in there. Uh, but, you know, for me, it's always been that journey. Eventually, I sold the PR firm to my employee uh, because I became uh, eventually the chief marketing officer of Eastman Kodak and they wouldn't let me have a lot of outside interest. So I sold. Um, that well, actually, I sold it the first time, uh, the first time to uh, my employee, and I started. I went to a, a, what became a public, another public traded business called Color Star, Color Bus, and was a raster image processors a company in the mid '90s that I we sold, and so we had, and we took that company in multi millions of dollars, and I became the head of marketing and sales for that company, and then left that company. And it was bought by Sheldon Adelson 
one of the richest men in the world, Sheldon. We managed all of his tech investments and he owned Comdex. So we helped him sell Comdex for 968 million and he got 968 million and I got a watch. So, you know, the things you, things you learn as you go through these processes, right? Did you have a mentor that helped you through any of this when you were younger and getting started or how did you figure your way through it? Well, we all have mentors. I don't know if we always call them mentors, but people that we look up to, you know, is not somebody that, hey, will you be my mentor? There's more of that today than ever before, which is awesome. But back then I had, yeah, I had guy like, uh, you know, Harold Jones back in my early teens, who was a former Marine gunner. On a, on, a, on a helicopter uh, during Vietnam, and he moved us to, to Georgia where I was living. My dad was gone. Parents got divorced, and he, he became my surrogate kind of father, big brother, whatever you want to call, call it. He was one. There was a guy named Fred Penson who ran a plumbing company who hired me as a, a you know, to, to do odd jobs. You know, when I was about 15, 16, and, and, you know, I used to dig ditches and crawl under buildings and uh, unclog sewer pipes and do all that kind of stuff. But he taught me the value of a real hard work, you know, just like my parents did as well. And then there were later in life, there were people like Michael O'Connor. Uh, Michael owned a print shop and I bought that printing business and he taught me the value of of how to check the Z out every day. You don't even know what the Z out is, but it's a Z out was on the cash register and you turn the key to Z and it would total up your total for the day. And, uh, and you know, put it in different categories. That's how we used to look at stuff. We didn't have software, we didn't have QuickBooks, you know? And so you had to do all that stuff manually. He taught me, he said, what's your Z out? And I go, what the hell are you talking about? What's a Z out? And he, he said, I have to teach you everything? Yeah, you do, Mike. I bought this place from you. You gotta teach me, man. I don't know anything about this stuff. Um, but I, you know, here I was doing, you know, he had a business about 600,000. I was doing half his business because my association management firm was bringing all that business. I thought, well, man, I should buy him. And he said, yeah, you should, I should sell it to you. And so I bought his business. You know, I made money my first year. I owned that business, lost money the next two and made money the fourth year. And it was like, you know, that's what, you know, you learn through that. And then there was another guy named John Timmer. John was an insurance agent and, um, and he was a state legislator and he he was a very principled man and just a great man. And uh, and so, you know, these are people that, you know, you wouldn't know. No one would know, but they meant a lot to me. And um, and then growing up, you know, they kept me honest and kept me on, the, you know, narrow, you know, narrow path of saying, you know, focus on the things that were important in life and. And I was lucky enough to have them in my life. And then there are others that I that I see every day, Sean. I'm I'm mentored, you know, in my community. I lead a group of CEOs. I, I lead a group of thought leaders. Um, you know, we have podcasters. I, I learn from everybody every day, something new, you know. And I think that's the unique thing that that's important for everybody is that is that I go through life as I'm not aware of what I'm not aware of, right? I I don't know, and it's okay to be a beginner if you're gonna. You know, to be a maestro, you got to learn to play a lot of bad notes. And it's important for you to be able to to find those other people that can teach you those things that you didn't know, you know. And so I do my very best to do that every day. I like to think of the Japanese sword makers, how they may mm. have a master that they study under for like 30 years. And it's not until they're in their almost 60s that they start to be their own, like they're on their own making swords and having their own apprentices. It's like they spend the, the best years of their life learning how to do the job that they're going to spend the rest of their life doing. Well, and I, yeah. I like to think of the podcast as something like that as well, because I, I like you, I feel like I, I, there's so much I don't know. And so I, I, while I did have a formal mentor once before, that was a long time ago, I feel like my podcast guests are almost like mentors to me, even if it's only for an hour at a time. Oh, without question. And, you know, people always ask me, so what's your biggest mistake? I said, and I always say, I don't know, I haven't done it yet, which which means I've, I've had some doozies. I mean, like the pheasant farm and others. I mean, I've had some real doozies that I've done. But what I mean is we're always going to make mistakes and they're always going to be big. You know, let's hope they're big. Because that means you're going to do something bigger that's more successful. And that's just the nature of, you know, the nature of learning. And, yeah, every day you you typically or you learn how people do it, the way they do it. And sometimes the learning is, nah, I don't want to do it that way. You know, uh, that's OK, too. And and I think that's that's what you also get from, you know, like a mentor from other people. Like you you find your you find where you're solid at, you know, in terms of like this is how I do it. And and I'm. I'm that way. I, you know, I try to be as uh, centered. And you speak in Japanese, like like a keto, 
it's a great example. And have, having practiced that for a number of years, you, you learn to be centered. And I think that's important in, in who you are and what you are. And that way, if people come to you with this or that, you can, you know, like there are people sometimes to say, Jeff, I want to do business with you. Well, I don't want to do business with you. Why? Well, I just don't like you. You know, so, and I, it's OK to be, you know, to say that, to do that, to be who you want to be, because you know what your personal conditions of satisfaction are. And I think a lot of people don't spend time, especially, you know, as we're talking about entrepreneurs, I don't think they spend enough time talking about that or thinking about what it is they really want out of that business or out of their life or out of their personal life or their spiritual life. You know, I think those are the four key areas that you've got to concentrate on. And and the more time you spend saying, hey, what is it that I would like to get out of those? The better it is. And I find myself when I stray from that, that's when things don't go well. Um, you know, I, I you know, I like I right now I feel like I'm back in my zone that I wasn't in the zone over the last couple of years. And right now I feel like I'm, I don't know if it's because we're out of COVID or I just finally, you know, got my ass kicked and, or, you know, I'm kicking myself uh, in the ass or whatever, but I feel like, wow, where have I been? I'm so excited. And not that I wasn't being successful f before, but I wasn't being what I could be. And I think that's important for us uh, sometimes to answer our, ask ourselves, are we happy with what we're doing the way we want, or we're doing it today? And if you're not, then change it because you can't. I think COVID definitely had something to do with it. I think the last few years were a bit off for me, but there was something about like when January came around this year, I was like, you know, there's something about 2023. It's going to be different. It's going to be like a great. And so far it's been pretty good, but the last few years were pretty tough. I don't know no, what it's been suck. like for you, but no, I don't want to ever go through it again. And no, no one should. And by the way, I was talking to a, a, a booking agent uh, in in Paris today, and we were talking about that because Paris had a huge lockdown. This is an American who's living in Paris and then booking speakers like me. And, you know, I said, I don't think we'll ever go through that again. Now, we will have pandemics again. There's no doubt about it. I mean, we're going to face that. That's the nature of it. We're inventing stuff in labs we shouldn't be inventing. And we're, you know, and, and just uh, stuff is progressing. You know, call it Darwinism, whatever you want. But just stuff happens. And they go they go in waves and we've been able to stop them. And we'll be able to stop some in the future, but some we won't. Whatever. It'll be the nature. That's, that's the way human life evolves. But. I don't think we'll lock down people. I don't think people will stand for that. Um, you know, in South Dakota, we never shut down. Now, a lot of people give our governor credit for it, but she gets too much credit for it because, you know, we've been practicing physical distancing since 1889. So it's not like it's a big deal. So, you know, my nearest neighbor is, you know, way down the road. Right. So the chances of me, you know, getting it or having it or, you know, as long as I'm, you know, staying away from people. But I just don't think we'll go through that. And it in the toll that it took on business, that is, it was just unfair. And we can't do that to people again. We can't. And not to mention what it costs us. $14 trillion in, in, in bailouts of, you know, different companies. And, and it didn't, it wasn't fair to everybody. I mean, there were a lot of people who didn't get, get their, their fair share of whatever that was. I just, it's just wrong. So I'm currently running this business we live to build. And I'm invested in two other businesses that are active. And I'm advising another business for equity that's active. And it's a lot for me. It's difficult for me to manage the energy from all of it. How, how do you do it? Are you an active investor? Or are you just kind of like, here's, here's my money. Here's some connections, have fun. You know, let me know if there's, if you need to exit or something like, how do you handle all of that? I think you, I think you get a good sense. I'm pretty much in charge of the things I want to be in charge of the way I want. I mean, that's just, who I am. I'm a driver. If you go back to the personality types, I'm, I don't even know what it is on the, on, you know, a couple of those, what do you call it? Um, the, the personality types, I can't remember what it is, but the, you know, I'm a driver. Yeah, whatever. I'm a driver. Look, I'm in your face. I have two modes of operation. I'm either seducing you or killing you. That's I'm overpowering you. That's just the nature of that's, that's who I am. Got it. That's it. I, you know, I don't make any excuses for it. That's the way it goes. I serve on 14 corporate boards today. Uh, four of those are publicly traded companies. The balance of them are, are private. Uh, half of those I own, the other half I invest in. And in those boards that, let's say, if I were investing in your company, 
I get very active. I help you raise money. I help you succeed because I got a piece of that action and I'm, I'm a, I'm, I can help make a difference. And I, and I'm very active on the boards. I meet every week with the CEOs of those companies to say, Hey, what do we got on our agenda or every two weeks? And I'm acting as a mentor for them. I'm making conduits in terms of, uh, for, uh, being a conduit for introductions on what on a whole host of things, whether it's you know investors, new new customers, partners, channels, you know all kinds of things, talent in some cases because in as uh, as you know in many startups we need great talent and to find people and of course I've got a network of people you know th- you know th- I'm 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 tapped out at thirty five thousand on. LinkedIn, but yet I got, you know, um, another bunch of that more that follow me 500,000 on Twitter and so forth and so on. So I use that network very well to help those companies as much as I possibly can. And of course, then my platform on the C-suite network with podcast shows and TV shows and, and, you know, and helping them to accelerate or hyperscale number one thing that I try to do. Hey, just give me 10 seconds of your time. I really appreciate you listening to the episode so far, and I hope you're loving it. And if you are, I would love to ask you to subscribe to the channel because what we do is a lot of work. And every week we bring you a new guest and a new story. And what we do requires so much love so that we can bring you something amazing. And every week we're trying really hard to get better guests that have better stories and improve our ability to tell their stories. So your subscription lets the algorithm know that what we're doing is fantastic and no commitment, it's free to do. And if you don't like what we're doing later on, you can always unsubscribe. And either way, we would love a like if you don't feel like subscribing at this time. Thank you very much. And we'll take you back to the show now. How many hours a night do you sleep? Because there's this there's this argument in society now about how much people should sleep. And there's people like Gary Vaynerchuk that's like, you shouldn't sleep. You should work yourself to death. And then there's other people that disagree with that. And so I'm just curious where you fall in that. Yeah, Gary's young. Gary's young. You know, you, when you get older, you start to learn, you know, yeah, I, I was like that. I mean, I would pull all nighters and do that. And I, you know, I'd still do that. And occasionally I might do that if it's really, really important. I get literally uh, six to eight hours every night. You know, um, but I also I'm very organized and I go to bed early and I get up early and I use those early hours. In fact, you know, I started at four this morning and I'm ahead before everybody else is. And and by the time I hit the office by seven, seven thirty, um, you know, most people don't get in till nine. I'm still ahead of them and I still can't keep up because I'm so excited. I I go to bed at night hoping I hurry up and sleep so I can get going the next day. That's how excited I am about stuff and doing stuff. Um so that, you know, but again, I'm very organized. I use things like, you know, like I love monday.com. Uh you I'm sure there there are other programs out there. That's the one I started using. I love that. I you know, I even have shopping list with my wife on there that we keep track of stuff and it helps me organize. I meet every morning with my executive assistant. I went without an executive assistant for a number of years. I'll never do that again. You know, I thought, well, I can do it myself. You know, it's COVID, I'll save money. And so uh, when that, I stopped before, right before COVID. And now I'm much more efficient, much more effective. And every day we go through the list of all the things that we've got, what's my, what's on my to do things. You know, like I got like 60 items today. I can't get to 60 items, but I have to focus in on what are the five key ones that are going to get me where I need to go today. And then I'll move them. I'll move the ones I never get done to the next day. Big deal. No one died, you know, or I try to live by Sean automate, delegate, eliminate. So I look at everything on my plate that day. What do I need to automate or uh, delegate or eliminate? And that's what I do every day. And I put that, that's one of my items every day that pops up on my to-do list, automate, delegate, eliminate. And then sales, and my certain, you know, certain sales that I want to do, and then all the other projects and everything else. But very organized. You know, I got the board for every, you know, I got a, a Monday board for every board that I'm on. I've got a Monday board for campaigns that I'm overseeing with the marketing team. Um, you know, different project. I'm looking over here. My ma- I run some masterminds. I run 
my, the, my brand of uh, the team and I meet with them and then, and then again, all the boards that I'm on. So, uh, you, you know, I'm always focused on the boards for whether it's IFLIP, Patriots, Apex. I mean, I can go right on down the, the list and making sure I'm doing the things that we need to do. Well, it definitely sounds very organized. I like to think I'm organized, but I, I think you're making me feel like I'm completely disorganized comparatively, which is fine. No big you, deal. You know, but it can overwhelm you. You could get too organized, right? But I try, you know, look, I, I find myself, you know, constantly going back to using paper and then going back to my remarkable <laughs> or whatever. I just have found that if I, I got to stick to a system, if I don't stick to a system, you know, I, I think one of the most effective things I've been watching a lot of videos lately where they're talking about time blocks. Well, I've been using time blocks forever where I block out certain times. That's what I'm spending the time on. That's what I'm doing. And every day I, I spend out, I block out times for my, with my assistant to make sure I'm delegating uh, with my CEO of my company to make sure that she's, you know, I'm, I'm supporting her and the team on what they need to do. So she and I talk every day. And then I, you know, and then I've got sales, my own sales, because I'm the best salesperson there is uh, for our companies or for the companies I'm working with. I'm, I'm good at it. And um, I'm a great marketer, but I'm also a great salesperson. So, uh, you know, my marketing drives sales. That's it. In the end, that's how you keep score, you know, is how much you sell. And so I spend a lot of time uh, working sales. So I want to go back to the executive assistant real fast. I have what I call an executive assistant for myself. There's things that I've trained her to do, tasks that I used to do. But from what I understand, the best executive assistants aren't ones that are really being told what to do. They're the ones kind of telling you what you need to be doing. Or do you, do you disagree? Or is it a mix of both? Oh, I totally agree. I mean, when I was a chief marketing officer at Fortune uh, you know, 100 company, I had a couple people. Someone worked on my schedule and, you know, because you can imagine your schedule is just nuts. You know, I used to have, you know, imagine what it's like when you're at that level. Fortune, well, Fortune 100 officers, 500, there's 500 of those, five at each company, roughly. There's 500. That's the most elite group. There are more people. There are more people playing professional football than there are Fortune 1000 officers, just to give you that. So it's a very elite group when you think about it. And so, I mean, when I go to a trade show, I mean, they beat me at my door at seven o'clock to be three or four people. Someone's handing me an egg sandwich and a Diet Mountain Dew because I used to drink Diet Mountain Dew back then. And then uh, they, they, they then someone would start telling me my schedules were walking toward the elevator. Someone's already moved up ahead of us so they can press the elevator button so that the, you know, the, the doors open before I get there. Because they don't want to waste your time. I know it's a bunch of bullshit, but it, uh, to some extent, because like, you know, sometimes when Mr. Hazlett, do you need to show you the bathroom? No, I think I can go to the freaking bathroom by myself. OK, I don't need you for that. All right. But they would have pre walked the route that we're about to take. So that I mean, so that we're not wasting time. I mean, that's the kind they would shuffle into back doors, all that. So that's the that's the world that I uh, I got used to. Right. And then, you know, it's like it's like Jim Baker once said, who was a former secretary of state for Ronald Reagan. He goes, you one day you're being driven around in, in, with security and uh, and a private limb is bulletproof limousine to the next day. You got a cab driver who speaks Farsi. Right. And so when you go from a corporate job like that to your own, then you're on your own. You got to rebuild all these things. And but one of the best things that I have is, you know, like somebody says, hey, send me your scheduler for a meeting. I said, yeah, I'll send that link to you. Her name is Marilyn and Marilyn will schedule, you know, because I used to have like Calendly or something like that, which are great tools, by the way, except that they don't prioritize your time. Right. And if there's an open time and it right before something else, you might not want to have that meeting then. And you might want a lot an hour rather than half an hour or the 40 minutes that you only allow people to take. Right. So, so, you know, I have somebody like Marilyn who, who sits in on meetings with me and then she knows what I'm thinking, what the strategy is, where I need to go. And so she's thinking like that, that's what I need. So she's making decisions for me. Right. And, and like, so if, cause if I have to make those decisions, I, I just said it a while ago, because I said, like, for this interview, is it a video or audio? And she goes, well, it's video. I said, well, why don't you guys put it up there so I can get I can look nice for the for the video interview? And 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 I said, if I have to ask those questions, what do I need you for? And it's not derogatory. It's not trying to be mean. But that's what I'm expecting. 
from the team, right? My job as a CEO or um, a senior leader or chairman of the company is to hit a mark. Just like, you know, as a podcast, that's your job. Everybody in the business, his job is to make sure I hit that mark. All right. And all the things leading up to it, they, they should be taken care of. My job is to do what I'm supposed to do and do well. All right. And and that's what I, I really spend a lot of time with the team. Now, it takes time to train people to to set expectations, to talk about conditions of satisfaction. Hmm. It's not being mean when we say, hey, what the hell? Why am I doing this? Right. You know, um, and but I do say those things because if I if I don't, I'm not setting the right proper conditions of satisfaction and you're not living up to your potential of, of what you promised me you could do. And by doing that, you know, I look, I could cut my own grass, but, you know, is that the best use of my time, given what I can do? Right. I could, you know, sometimes I'll, I'll ask somebody, hey, go get me lunch or something, because, you know, and I try to bring lunch whenever possible because I'm trying to eat healthy and all that. But again, what is it the things that you could do for me that could take it off my plate? I don't have to do that. And we and that's what those morning meetings are for me every day. That's what I spend time you know, at least half an hour every day. Now, today we skipped it because yesterday we spent about an hour and we're too busy getting stuff done. Tomorrow we won't miss that because we'll we'll see where we're at with all the things that we have to do and what's important because we got a lot of things that are important this week to get done. And is she in your office or is she working remote or? She's right there. <laughs> She's listening to this conversation right now. She's right over there. Okay. So yeah, uh, I where I you know, but I, I probably see her four days out of the month, maybe, maybe uh, three, four days out of the month, physically together. The rest of the time, never. I mean, you know, and I'm okay with that. I'm used to that. Um, and but Zoom, you know, Zoom is obviously a great, you know, uh, or any video. I do we I do video calls, video call, video call, video call. That's all I do. I hardly ever do phone calls almost always video calls. I want to see people. I want to, you know, and when I'm talking to the CEO and I'm the chairman of the board or whatever or on the board, I want to see people. I want to see what you're doing, what you look like. You know, you know, uh, I'm on one board where it's a finance company and I was talking to the CEO and he's, you know, wearing a baseball cap and a, you know, a hoodie. I said, dude, you're representing a financial company. Look like I want to give you my money. You know, don't look like Mark Zuckerberg when he first showed up at Wall Street to go take his company public. And finally, they told him, hey, put on a frickin shirt with a collar and a jacket, for God's sakes. You know, you don't have to wear a tie. Well, you know, you're you're in somebody else's house. Right. So, you know, things like that. It's good. But I, I but we but that's, you know, when I was the chief marketing officer at Kodak, for instance, the executive team, like the four op, top officers, we met, you know, um, literally every week or two weeks, uh, every two weeks we met as a, a senior executive team. And but we all, we did them almost all remote because I was usually in Germany or I was in Israel or I was in China and the other one was in Italy. And, you know, we were all over the world. Um, and we I might have saw my CEO maybe once or twice a month face to face, maybe. So mm -hmm. just to give you an idea, because you, you're supposed to do your job, right? And that's, you know, at that level, we're doing our jobs. And if I don't know what my job is, I got a real problem. And but with Marilyn, you know, we meet every every typically the same time every morning, try to do that or thereabouts. And but we do go a few days when we don't meet from time to time. But we we communicate a lot by text and phone all the time. So how do you make sure being on a board of a company that the company is moving in a favorable direction for shareholders. So you always want to focus in on, first of all, what's the problem we're solving? That's number one. So what is it that we're solving? What's our, what's the key vision mission goal that we're doing? Then what are the goals, which are statements of direction? So what are those? And then you want to get into objectives, the measurable outcomes of that. So those have to be established for every single company, because if you don't know that, you don't know where you're going. Then then what will be the things that drive that? So in our last board meeting with this one company, you know, we went through about seven things. I said, great, to Mr. CEO. Now, those are the seven things, but you also mentioned these. So let's just call them our top 10. Now, can we each month that we meet from now on, you give us an idea of what those are, plus give me an idea of what what is our what is our adoption rate? 
What's our CAGR? What's it costing us to gain, gain those clients? And then we have three different ways that we're measuring those clients, big, huge whales, institutional or, or individual accounts. And then those individual accounts are broken down by three. Can you can give that report? Yes. Yes, Mr. Hazel, we can do we can do that. You know, uh, Jeff, we can do that. Great. That's that's what we're going to measure. And if we you get what you measure. And so so we I, so I really try to get us down to understanding what is it we're going to measure? How are we going to measure success? And then each month we need to look at that. Now, if we need to alter it, change it, that's not the right thing. And usually over a couple of months, it takes you a little bit of oh, muscle memory to get that muscle memory, a little bit of aches and pains to get there. But once you get that, that's what you should be looking at and measuring, right? That's that's what you look at every single day. And so you have to really outline what are those conditions of satisfaction and then, you know, put that on the agenda and make sure that that's what you're doing. And if it doesn't, bring it up. Be transparent in the conversation. Not be again. Some people say, oh, you're throwing people under the bus or doing. No, come on. You knew the bus was there. I mean, so, you know, let's have a discussion about it. And I'm not here to blame anybody. I'm here to get to where we need to go. We're we're always going to make mistakes. We're always going to have lots of mistakes. That, everybody just talks about fail fast. So that's bullshit. How about we win fast? I'd rather win fast. Failing sucks, you know, and I don't like losing. And so I want to win fast. And so that's what we try to do is like, if that's where we're going, then let's figure out how we measure it. And let's make sure that's what we're talking about all the time. What would it take for you to insist on firing a CEO? And have you ever had to fire a CEO? Yeah, all the above. Yeah, yes, I have. Typically, it's because they they are um, they're not delivering on conditions of satisfaction, or they violated values of the company. You know, uh, and I've been in big fights. I've been in fights on the front page of the Wall Street Journal. A good good example: RMG, which uh, which was a a company based in Dallas, and the CEO, a chairman of that company, he wasn't the CEO, the chairman of that company tried to take the company over and buy it. Publicly traded company. Well, great. He could do it. His name was Greg. I said, Greg, you can do that. I'll for you if that's what you want to do. There were five members of the board of directors. I was the only independent, which means it was him and then three of his buddies, friends, people that used to work for him. And then I was the independent and they acquired the, the company RMG. And I stay, I was the only board of director that stayed on the board of the new company. Okay. And here he is. Now he wants to take over the company and basically take it private. Well, when you do that in a company, it requires you certain fiduciary responsibilities by the board to get a fair price for that company for the shareholders. And he was trying to do it in a way that maybe <laughs> it didn't quite do that. Now, maybe could, maybe not. But you see, you have to follow certain kinds of things or you get sued. Well, we ended up getting sued. He got sued. The board got sued. Everybody gets sued. And if you're on a publicly traded company, you're going to be sued all the time, constantly being sued. And, you know, once my wife said, why are you doing this? I said, it's because what good people do. Because in that particular case, I'm in a front page of the Wall Street Journal. SEC starts looking at it. And we were in the right. And I got two of the board of directors, two of his buddies, friends to join to say, no, 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 no. We have to go out and, and look for other bids for the company. Could be that you're going to win, but we're going to take it. This is a responsibility. Well, it's going to cost us a million bucks to do it. Well, that's the cost of doing business. And if you're, you know, if your bid successful, then you, yep, you're going to eat that cost. Or just like these other guys might eat the cost. And you, you get to win. Great. But we're going to do it right. And that was a good example of where I would have fired that guy in a heartbeat uh, because of the way in which he violated those values. And, you know, it's just a, you know, do I still see him today? Yeah. Am I cordial to him? Absolutely. Would I serve on a board for him? Very doubtful, you know, but, um, but, you know, that's the things you have to you know, learn. And by the way, during that period, I lost my entire investment in that company. Okay. And I got sued and, you know, had to turn over all kinds of stuff to the SEC and stuff like that, which I gladly did because, you know, we were in the right. Uh, on that particular th thing. And, um, and again, like my wife said, why are you doing this? You're not getting paid. You're getting sued. This is a pain. And I said, it's because that's what good people do. And if good people don't stand up and do that kind of stuff, that's, that's not, that's just not right. I was going to ask earlier. So you've given me a good segue into it. What's one of the hardest things about being part of a public listed company? Is it being sued all the time? Or is there something that's worse than that? Uh, well, I, I think, I think it's the 
the biggest thing I think about being, a, that's one of them. You, and just understand that's just the nature of it. You just think that's the case. And I've been on lots of boards, big boards, taking companies public. 21 billion uh, was one of the biggest ones we did. But, but the, um, probably it's the, it's the government oversight that believes all businesses are bad. And, and so you're paying the price of bad companies. Good companies pay the price of bad companies. And the Sarbanes-Oxley stuff, things like that. I mean, you're signed, you, when you when you sign a document, I mean, I remember when I was at Kodak and I had to sign documents as an officer of that company that basically said, if this is wrong, you're going to jail, you know? And so, you know, those are the things like, you got to really make sure you trust your team there. You know, that the CFO is the CFO, knows what he's doing, which, by the way, we had one of the best CFOs I've ever had in my entire career. He was one of the few that I actually really liked, you know, because most CFOs just say no. He would say no, but he'd give you a reason for it. And you'd have a discussion and you were able to negotiate a little bit, you know, in terms of, OK, what problem? You know, Frank was his name. He was really good. Frank was just awesome. And and um, again, one of the best I've ever worked with. And, and I say work with because we work together. He's one of the few CFOs I work together. Like he would come to me and say, Jeff, we have to trim 10, you know, 10 percent out of the overall budget. And I say, OK, let's do it. And he goes, Jeff, you're the only officer in the company. Say, so let's go do it. I said, Frank, you, you said we had to go do it. And if we have to go do it, I'm, I'm trusting you. You know what we do now. I don't know if it's 10 percent for mine or it's or maybe we got to put 20 percent for my budget or it's got to be 20 from somebody else. But let's sit down and figure this out, you know. And I said, that's what we got to do. That's what we got to do. I said, this is a business. You got to run the business now. Let's, but at the same time, I used to go to Frank and say, OK, Frank, let's I'm going to trim to 10 percent. But let's also look at the, the revenue that's going to come down. He goes, what do you mean? And I go, well, if I take advertising and marketing down, then sales are going to come down, dude, that they're, they're connected. So let me show you where, you know, those two are connected. So we're going to need, you know, 15 percent from this side and 20 percent from this side if we're going to take this revenue down. So, you know, he, 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 he and I started investing in certain things. We would look at things and, and change the narrative. But, but uh, getting back to what's the negative things, I think that's the biggest thing. The other thing is the, I don't like sometimes the, the, um, the, the rigor that you have to go through sometimes. You have to operate a little bit, you know, more uh, formal. And I, I don't always care for that sometimes. Well, it's one of the best things about, being part of a public listed company? You know, the ability to get capital. I mean, that's what it's for. You know, people think it, 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 going public is that's your, your cash out, right? No, not always. It's, it's, it's a, going public is in a very expensive activity and a lot of scrutiny is coming your way. But it, the real mechanism for going public isn't for you and the officers and the founders to cash out, the original shareholders. It's really about raising capital in order to be able to sustain the growth of the company and to, you know, hyperscale, hopefully hyperscale it. That's the real purpose for it. So as a mechanism for raising capital, that's where it's very good. I, it also then, I think, also raises the bar in terms of your legitimacy of a company. You're in a very elite group. And you just like, no, let's just take North America. There's 28 million businesses in North America. Well, how many of those are publicly traded companies? 15,000. I mean, I mean, that's that that's it out of 28 million, 15,000. That's a pretty heady group. That's that's phenomenal when you think of it, you know. Um, so that's wow. I mean, just it blows my mind when you think about that, um, you know, and how many of those are, you know, and then out of the 23 million, how many are billion dollar companies? A billion or greater, seven, seven thousand. That's it. So it's and I mean, this is a very it's you know, that that group is a very elite group. And and, you know, having served on it or been in one of those companies, which I have both and still am. Um, yeah, it's pretty, pretty special. What's something you're excited about? Well, personally, my grandkids. I mean, that's that, I mean, if you look at the things that are really things that mean something in your life, it's you know, it's your it's to me, for me. It's that that's the most important thing is to watch them and. And, and to do imprint, imprint them as much as I can, me on them, you know, so, so, you know, and I got three granddaughters and I got uh, a, what, what, eight, six, and now a, a three week old. 
And so, and the eight and six, you know, I was like uh, reflecting on this the other day. We went out to, we went out to dinner and I had the six-year-old sign for the bill. You know, I take my credit card. She, she asked for the bill and I teach her how to do that. You know, I are the eight-year-old already knows the six-year-old's her turn. And, and then she's got to sign the check. Now I can't wait to start using her credit card, but that, that, that's a different, that's later on in life. But but, you know, but that's empowering them and doing that. To me, that's exciting is to be able to, you know, especially young girls and to give them more confidence, more sass, more whatever, um, more uh, aggressiveness to be able to uh, to be real, to really succeed the way they that I hope that they're going to succeed. Yeah, it's really important for kids to have that. I, I majored in psychology. And I spent a good bit of that time looking at how the brain develops in early childhood and therefore, you know, at what age does is a child able to do what and, and these kinds of things. And um, I noticed that a lot of people typically just ignore kids when they're around adults. And so I make it an effort to like like look at them and talk to them and engage them and have them and, and not just be like, hey, how are you? But like actually, you know, communicate with them so that they have an opportunity. And it's so important. I was thinking about that. Yeah, my my favorite, my favorite, absolutely, Sean. My favorite question is, "What'd you learn in today? What'd you learn today?" That's usually my first question. "What'd you learn in school today?" I want to know what you learned. Well, what'd you do? Uh, no, come on, you're going to answer that question. I really drive that question. You know, my daughter is my oldest. Uh, you know, she hated. She hated when she was younger. We'd go to a restaurant and they would ask me what they wanted her and her brother, they would ask me, well, what do the children want? And I would say, ask them, you know, and I, and I, today, even when I take my granddaughters out to dinner, like we did the other day, I, they order themselves more, they're going to go hungry. And, and so, you know, because I'm not, you know, I'll work with them on the menu and things like that, but they know besides Mac and cheese, you know, what else would you like to have? Oh, and no chicken tenders. OK, what else would you like to have? And that's usually I try to steer them on eating something different than on the menu. You know, try try something that's different, you know, whether it be, you know, like a, anyway, more than chicken tenders and, and mac and cheese. But but to do that, I think helps a lot of people. And the same thing in business. Do the same thing. Like I have a new cup. I got a new CEO of the company. And everybody says, Jeff, what do you want to do? I said, I don't know. Ask Trisha. So I got a cup. This is hash, a hashtag. Just ask Trisha. She's the CEO from now on. That's what I hold up. You don't ask me those questions. Ask the CEO. As a marketing question, don't ask me. Ask the CMO. Ask Tyler. Go. You know, those are the things we should be doing. And and it's easy for the chairman or for the CEO, depending on your leadership structure, to answer those questions for everybody else. Yeah, I agree. I think it's important for people to be able to do that. And I tried when in my last business, when I was a lot younger, I tried to answer as many of the questions as I could, but found very quickly, I had no idea what I was talking about. And so I would often get into arguments with my COO because he'd be like that. You have no data to prove what you've just said. He's like, you can't back up. He's like, you're, you're expressing an opinion or you're expressing something that's hearsay. Like, give me something that makes me like be able to know that this actually has weight to it rather than you just saying it. And so he would force me to like go back and actually find things. And then he would challenge me based on the data sources and like, okay, fine. You just do it yourself. Like I just, just I give up. You just do it. <laughs> yeah. Well, if, it, if it, no, but if it was easy, everybody could do it. Right. And, and by the way, there's a, that's one of the cool things I think about thought leaders. And I work a lot with thought leaders, you know, coaches, trainers, authors, speakers, and, and CEOs who are thought leaders as well. We have a couple groups of those in the C-suite network and every, anybody can give you an opinion. Anyone can give you advice, but advice is usually given by people who've never done it before. Thought leaders, you know, give you counsel and counsel. And that's what the CEO was asking for. He's asking for counsel. He's not asking for, Hey, you know, pop this off, pop that off. No, why I'm asking. And counsel is usually given by people who have done it before, who really know the facts and knows what it's like and say, I can say, well, here's how I've done it in the past, or here's how so-and-so did it. And that's a very valuable, that's valuable. And that's what CEOs are doing. Most CEOs, you come to me or CMO, any C-suite executive, our job isn't to be the smartest people in the room. It's to be the most strategic. And everyone comes to me with problems. That's all they do all day. How about you be unique and come to me with a freaking solution? 
That's what I'm looking for. I'm looking for clock change. I'm looking for people who come with solutions. And by the way, those are few and far between because everybody shows up with a problem. Hey, did you know? Of course I know. What am I, an idiot? You know, of course so. Thank. I call it Tyco. Thank you, Captain Obvious. Fair enough. What's the most important thing you've learned to date in your life? That I don't know what I don't know. I don't know what I don't know. And I think that's one of the most important things that most of us, my job isn't to change you. My job is just to understand. And so my job is to try to understand as much as possible. So I don't know everything. So uh, I know some things and I know what I've done, but that doesn't mean it's going to hold for the future. And that's what I don't know.